Okay, you got my star trails? Yes. Okay. Cool. So let's bring you back on camera. John. Let's try that stop sharing and see what that did. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, say again. Go ahead and talk again, John. Okay. I, uh, I just wrote down a few notes of things I want to mention, uh, and we can go from there. What do you want to mention, John? Well, I just kind of have a few things here as far as for, for somebody that's first getting into that, just a few, what I consider some of the, uh, the key things. Uh, naturally, other people have different opinions. You know, we all, we all kind of do, but uh, at some point here, I'd just like to mention a few things that I think uh, a, a beginner should keep in mind. Sounds like a plan. And you give okay. you you when when you give advice on Facebook, I generally always agree with it a hundred percent. You know, there was one, something this morning or last night you commented on, you know, about something. I was like, "Yep, exactly." So, all right, Paul, we're, we're ready to go anytime. Okay, didn't know if that was accurate or not. Are we live now? I don't know, Kent. We're we're sitting here at over 100 degrees here today for a while, so I'm not sure. Uh, I always tell people to come down here, but I'm not encouraging too many people right now. Hey, if you've got good skies, doesn't matter the temperature. But has the smoke? Were you, did you have any smoke? John, can you hear me? Hey everybody, Kent Martz here. Welcome to First Light Chronicles here on Wednesday. I'm from broadcasting from uh, Studio Stage 2 in Studio A here at Explore Scientific in Springdale. I have a special guest with me today, uh, John Adler, a friend I met, I don't know, back in 2017, I guess. 2018. Uh, the, 2018 at yep. the uh, Yerkes Starlight Festival. Met John for a couple of hours and spent some time talking to him out in front of the observatory in the shade on that beautiful day. And uh, we've been Facebook friends since. At that time, John was on the road, uh, ended up traveling for, I think it was a, exactly a thousand days in an RV 
and uh, they was doing astronomy and going places. Uh, so uh, I thought John's story was fun and interesting. Uh, he now runs a uh, an astronomy uh, bed and breakfast down uh, uh, near Rodeo, New Mexico. So he is heavily involved in astronomy. But one day he was like everybody else and wanted to do, do astronomy but didn't know where to get started. So I thought it would be interesting to talk to John about that subject. So, uh, John, give him a little bit more background about yourself, and then uh, let's go ahead and jump in and just have this conversation about how you get started in doing this hobby that both you and I love, right? All right. I sure can, Kent. Yeah, it was it was a fun day when we met up there in, uh, at Yerkes. Uh, I met you and I met Scott that same day. Uh, we were in the middle of traveling in our RV. Uh, I've had a couple different careers. I, I spent 25 years as an engineer for state government up in South Dakota where I grew up. And then for six years, we owned a campground in the Black Hills of South Dakota. We got to a point where we decided, ah, let's sell the campground and let's, uh, let's go live in our RV for a while. So we traveled around for about four years, I think it was, uh, uh, traveling around. I think we hit 43 states in that amount of time and looking for dark skies and finding observatories to go to. But about that, a uh, little before we did that, I decided, you know, I'm going to have some, some free time. I need a hobby. So uh, I kind of thought back to when I was a kid. I had a little telescope and thought that was kind of a fun hobby. So while we still own the campground, I bought a cheap little telescope and, and started playing around with it and with a camera and tried to do a, take some astro photographs. And it's a long learning curve. And the one thing I will say, there's a lot more resources now than there was six years ago. Uh, there's a lot of Facebook groups and things like that that are very helpful. And I know that I'm in a lot of those. Uh, Kent is in a lot of those. There are times that, uh, that I will answer questions, and there's times that I need questions answered. But uh, one of the interesting things through that group is that I've got friends that I've never met literally all over the world. And there's times that uh, I think in a typical day, I will be texting or messaging with half a dozen different people about astronomy and about astrophotography. But uh, a lot of these groups are people that are just getting into it. And uh, before I got on here, I kind of scribbled down a few notes as far as my opinions. And again, they're just simply my opinions on some things that people that want to get into it need to know. Uh, the one thing that I do think is interesting is that uh, not everybody knows all the answers. Not everybody is right all the time. Uh, it's kind of interesting how there will be uh, almost arguments going on about what's the best telescope. You know, and some people are, are in the refractor camp and some are in the re reflector camp and some are in the Schmidt camp. And uh, to me, it's kind of like Ford versus Chevy. You know, they all work. They all do the same thing. Sometimes it's just a matter of personal preference, what you like best. I personally am a reflector guy. I like my reflectors. That's not to say that uh, the others are bad. It's just that that's kind of what I learned on, and that's uh, what I've been doing. So uh, when you yeah. started, what did you know? What did you know? Zero? What did I know? Did you? I knew, yeah. I knew very little. Uh, it was kind of interesting. We had a fellow that stayed in our campground. Uh, he he had, it was kind of an extended stay. And he had done some astro work back years ago when it was all using film cameras. And boy, I tell you what, we have changed so much since that time. You know, he would tell yes. me stories about he'd, he'd go out and take pictures and and uh, take the, you know, and he didn't, didn't, didn't develop his own. I know guys that developed their own film, but of course he'd take it in someplace and, and tell them, okay, when you look at the negatives, the negatives are going to look white, you know, and, and go ahead and process and print those because there, there is something there. Trust me. It's not just simply black. So then he'd end up waiting a few days and find out that ah, darn it was out of focus or any number of things, you know, or, or darn mm -hmm. it, my, tracking wasn't as good as it should have been. So today we have it so easy with the cameras we have now and the equipment we have now. It, it's so much easier than it was back then. Instant you know, feedback. You, instant, instant feedback. Instant. Instant. You can tell right away if you're out of focus or you should. Although I've seen people that take pictures all, you know, for several hours 
only to realize they forgot to take the baton off mask off. And you, it yeah. should be pretty obvious after you take one or two shots that, gee, that star looks funny. But uh, they yeah, just weren't we, looking. We see it. Yeah. All right. So, so what, what do your notes tell us? What are your, what do your notes tell us? Well, one of the things that uh, that I find a lot of folks they they want to get into it, but they they just want to jump in and 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 do everything. And one of the things I say is figure out what it is you want to shoot. You know, uh, do you want to shoot galaxies? Do you want to shoot other DSOs? Do you want to shoot planetary, or do you just simply want to go out and 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 I say simply because it takes the least amount of equipment. Do you want to do Milky Way shots and star trails? But figure out what you want to do, because unfortunately, the equipment you use, the techniques you use, and the software you use are different for all three of those. And no one setup is going to do great at all of those. It's like a hammer. I've been using the hammer analogy. There's tack hammers and framing hammers and roofing hammers and sledgehammers and jackhammers. They're all hammers. And you, and you could drive nails with an eight-pound sledgehammer. For a framing hammer, but it's a lot easier to use the framing hammer, you know. And yeah. the other thing is, they'll say, "Well, I want to race cars." Okay, do you want to race go karts or NASCAR or IMCA modified? Do you want to race trucks? And they're like, uh, "I don't know. I just want to. I just want to. I want to race," yeah. you know. And they don't or know do what they want to do. Yeah. Or, or a drag, run a drag strip. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I, 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 you, you use. The, you use the hammer analogy. I often talk about saws. I know one time when I was working in our campground, I was working on a project, and at the end of the day, I thought, I used six different saws today. You know, I used a table saw, and I used a miter saw, and I used a reciprocal saw, and I used a, a jig saw, and I used a circular saw. And it's like, yeah, they all saw, but they all do something different. You know, some of these jobs, it's like, boy, without a reciprocal saw, that would have taken me, you know, half an hour instead of a yeah. minute and a half. John, somebody just agreed with us in the chat function that said, yes, film was hard. Digital was uh, <laughs> from someone who started with film. I agree that digital cameras are a miracle and they yeah. are. It, it was in the film. That's why I didn't do it. I was a photographer and I gave up. It was just too much work. I could do black and white, but it was just, it's just, it wasn't worth it to me. The value, the value of even being able to go and, develop my own black and white film and go out and monitor and adjust. It just wasn't worth it to me, you know, and the, the entry point is so much easier. Everybody out there has a DSLR or used to, and they're out there mm -hmm. cheap now, you know, a cheap kit camera can do so much more than an expensive camera with film could do 20 and 30 years ago. Uh, right. In fact, I think you have a Milky Way shot, don't you? Or a star trail? Uh, let's see here. One of the first ones I've got here. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I can do this right here again. <laughs> yeah, this is. So we, we don't see. use a uh, zoom. We use a different program that takes a little bit of learning. And let's see here now. If I go to the right thing, there we go. There Are we you go. seeing that uh, star trail? Yeah. Yes, sir. That star trail was using, well, and, and that happens to be one of my observatories. I'm kind of spoiled. I've got several uh, observatories down here. And, and maybe here, at some point here, I'll back up and kind of tell you how I ended up here. But, but that star trail picture was done with a, with a uh, DSLR and a standard 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens. Uh, the camera lens cost me, I think, $225. And that's on a $15 tripod that I bought at a thrift store. So that's a two hundred fifty dollar, not two hundred fifty dollar equipment. John does not buy new equipment. He, uh, which <laughs> shame on you, John. You need to buy all new equipment from Explore Scientific. No, John buys uh, used equipment, really is thrifty in his gear, and gets supreme mileage out of it because he tries. Uh, he understands there's no easy button here, right? Um, it, it takes. Yeah. There's, there's a, it's now an easier button than what it was 15 years ago, but there is a uh, not an easy button. Uh, real quick, uh, Pekka Haltelow, one of our regulars, says, Howdy, everyone, and happy birthday, Scott. Today is Scott's birthday, and uh, oh. we're thankful Scott was born today. 
uh, because we had a pizza party in his honor. So we got pizza. So there you go. So (laughs) anyway, that's a good. uh, All right. So go on. But uh, I I think I'm going to back up a little bit and just kind of tell how we ended up where we did. Uh, Like I said, we'd we'd been traveling around uh, in the motorhome and spent most of our winter south. Having grown up in South Dakota, I decided I didn't want winter anymore. Um, Wait a minute. minute. uh, South John. John. Yeah. South Dakota is in the south. Yeah, I know. There's south of North Dakota. Yeah. Yeah. There's only one state between us and Canada. Yeah, exactly. But, so yeah, you, be, you became Florida, snowbirds. We, I was just telling someone earlier today that we experienced 117 degrees when I lived in Pierce, South Dakota. Six months later, right. in the same town, we experienced 35 below zero. And mm-hmm. I don't like either of those. You know, right. down here in New Mexico, uh, we're we're over 100 degrees today, but the lowest I've seen down here is about uh, somewhere between 15 and 20. So, yeah, but your humidity is really, really low. I I think it's a little higher today. It might be double digits. But uh, Ooh, there's a brutal. lot of days our humidity is like 5%. You know, so right. we don't have to worry about uh, what we do. Let's see so here. This, so, so, so John lives uh, near Rodeo, New Mexico. Um, and he ended up buying a little casita, uh, 500 square foot, if I remember, for he and his wife to live in on. I don't know, how many acres was it, John, or is it? We bought nine and a half acres. The house is only 400 square feet. And okay. we did that right at three years ago. The intent was that we were going to uh, winter in it and still travel in the RV. Well, then, of course, COVID hit, and, and we had reservations. We had people who were going to reserve the, the house. The house is kind of nice because it does have its own roll-off observatory that's part of the rental. So if you rent that little house, you get to rent a, a 10 by 12 roll off roof observatory to put your telescopes in. But we had reservations. And then when COVID hit, the reservations all started canceling, which was just as well because we ended up not going anywhere. So we ended up staying here and did that for a couple of years. And right a little over a year ago, we decided, well, things have changed with my wife's uh, medical condition. She has uh, multiple sclerosis and doesn't get around well. So it was good that we traveled and we did because now traveling is almost out of the question. But uh, just over a year ago, we decided we wanted uh, a little bit bigger property or a little bigger place for us to live in. And that's after we lived in that small one for two years. And having lived in an RV for four years, we're used to really small spaces. But we looked into it. I even looked uh, looked into buying the, the, a property next door to us and met with a guy and I said, you know, I could put in another uh, uh, another house over here and then rent out the small one. And as we're walking around, he looked, turns to me and says, you know what, you got enough land, you don't need to buy another lot. So that's what we ended up doing. We ended up moving another house in onto the same lot. And I've since put in another, well, since then another three observatories. So we have our and, and house, every, the small house. What's that? And everyone, you, you, you're buying these, people are selling them, and you'll drive to places in Arizona, <laughs> New Mexico, and pick them up, right? Uh, somebody I've, I've asked. Up, so Jim Nor would ask, yeah, it, Jim Nor would ask, is John's <laughs> place the famous Adler Planetarium? And the answer is he wishes it was, but it's not. Yeah, I wish it was. But yeah, you're right. I have picked up a couple domes used. Uh, I like my roll-offs. You know, people ask me because I do have two roll-offs. I have a 10 by 12 and a small dome over at the rental house. Over here, I put in a 10 by 15 and another dome. Uh, So I have both. I like my roll-offs. But of course, none of my domes are automated. If my domes are automated, I might have a different tune. But again, it's like everything else. Both things have an advantage. Uh, the domes right. do a better job of blocking the wind. The disadvantage is, well, there's several disadvantages. One, if it's not automated, you got to go out there and you're going to be rotating your dome on a regular basis, especially if you're shooting DSOs. My one dome I usually use mainly for uh, uh, for visual and I use it for uh, for doing some planetary imaging. So moving it isn't quite as critical. Uh, the other good thing about my roll-offs is there's room for more than one rig. 
you go into a dome and and, and uh, even a big dome, there's usually only room for one telescope and one one setup. But uh, so we do now, like I said, uh, in, in those domes, it's kind of interesting. The one I bought from a fella that uh, he had basically saved from the trash a few years ago. It had some damage to it. I bought it for a whole hundred dollars. It's an eight foot uh, Explorer dome. And it also came with the uh, the roof panels to put it on a 10 by 10 foot building. So I say I bought that for a hundred dollars, put the building underneath it. Uh, then I also have a small next dome that I bought from a guy and I, that was a package deal. I bought that and, uh, and a friend of mine went over to Tucson with me to pick that up and uh, the telescope that I bought. So the one friend of mine has gone over to Tucson with me to pick that up. And then a number of months ago, another friend of ours picked up a used dome also over in Tucson. And as a favor to him, that same friend of mine and I went over and bought it or picked it up and hauled it back to uh, this part of the country. And then a couple months ago, I saw another little dome, just the dome part of a sky shed pod that a guy was selling over in Benson, Arizona. And I went and picked that up. So it's just the dome part. I don't have the base to go under it. So now I'm trying to figure out how to utilize that. So by the time I'm done, I might have five observatories within 350 feet of each other. Okay, so John, this is sort of the pinnacle, right? Of, of everybody's, everybody's pinnacle is one dome and you've got five. What was the hardest part getting started for you? You know, I mean, now the hardest part is not spending money on domes because they obviously come up very regularly on Facebook Marketplace or, or Craigslist or wherever it is you're looking. Uh, but go back, you know, 10 years or however long it was, when you bought that first little telescope, what was the process you went through? A lot of it was just learning the sky and learning what I was doing, a lot of trial and error. And that's what I tell people, the practice, practice, practice. You know, you go out and shoot, you'll have nights that nothing works. You know, it's just the, 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 your focus is bad, your polar alignment is bad. You lose connection, the clouds roll in, there's always something that goes wrong. And hopefully you learn every time you do that. But uh, I just started trying things, found out that the scopes I had weren't good enough, um, bought a little bit better scope. Uh, I think at one time I had the, the, the dreaded Powermaster 127, which some people basically say is the worst telescope ever built. Well, I've seen some guys take some pretty good pictures with it. You know, it's just kind of a matter of uh, uh, how you learn to use it. But uh, while we were traveling, I would go onto Facebook Marketplace and go onto Craigslist, and I was picking up used equipment. Uh, the telescope I used after that was a, an eight-inch uh, reflector on a uh, Orion Skyview Pro. It had the dual motors, non-go to. I used that for quite a while, and with just a DSLR. And then eventually upgraded and upgraded again and have resold telescopes. Most of the time when I resell it, I get about the same amount that I paid for it. But uh, as an example, my single most expensive piece of equipment is the, one of my mounts that cost $850. That and, well, I guess the, the Astro camera I have, uh, I'm now using an S-Big Astro Cam. Uh, but I did that as, a, as a, a deal with a friend of mine, so there's no cash that changed hands. So we, uh, we did some some bartering for that camera. So I don't I really have a hard time putting a, a cash value on it. But uh, that's so, uh, John. A, to that. a couple of comments, Tariq, uh, in the UAE, um, who I think you're probably familiar with. He's you've seen him on oh, yeah. some of the forums. <laughs> he, he said practice. He says I've been trying to do this for four years. Uh, you know, and it's. It is a difficult thing. Um, it's not easy. And um, he says it's not working. You know, I, I think it's, I, I talk to people, you know, here at Explore Scientific who, uh, you know, I literally will talk them through, you know, step after step after step with the goal of, of having success with it. And the biggest thing mm -hmm. I see is people will buy the biggest, baddest, like a, They'll get a 127, and I'll try and talk them into getting an ED80. And they're so mm -hmm. hung up with a really, I want to, well, I, I don't want to have to buy another telescope. I want to get the biggest telescope I can get and just make that work. And and the challenge is, 
that's not the right way to do it. Back, back to racing. Well, my goal is to race in, in the Indy 500. So I'm going to start learning on an Indy car. You know, that's not going to work. That's not how the process mm-hmm. goes. Some people do it. Uh, so, you know, it, it's sometimes less is more in many cases. And, you know, I've not talked to D- Tariq directly, but, you know, um, after four years, we should be able to get him up and running uh, to do something <laughs> effectively. But, again, he's shooting from one from the UAE, probably tr- terrible light pollution, yeah. which is uh, very painful. So, uh, uh Tariq says he started with an ST80, which I practiced with for years, but now I'm still talking about DSO uh, practice. Okay, yeah. DSOs, deep sky objects, you know, with a light polluted site, you've got to be using filters. And that creates a whole computer workflow of manipulating photos, which is, not, I always sort of joke and say 90% of astrophotography is uh, the telescope. And the other 90% is the processing, uh, you know, uh, that it's, it's hard. Right. So, uh, yeah. so, so how'd you progress? Well, I, I, I guess a lot of it is, and, and that's one of, the, one of the other notes I wrote down here is more gear isn't always the answer. I know guys that have tens of thousands of dollars worth of gear and have never gotten a picture yet because they have never taken the time to learn what they're doing with it. Uh, you got to learn to use the equipment you've got, or if you bought the wrong equipment. Uh, a lot of people want to get into DSOs, and the first thing they do is they go out and buy a Schmidt with a 2,000 or 3,000 millimeter focal length, and that's tough. You're sitting there at F10, so you, you, you're not getting the light gathering that you need. Plus, with that uh, long focal length, if your tracking isn't perfect, you're going to get star trails. You're much better off starting with something that's a little easier and work your way up to that. I have a couple of Schmitz, and quite frankly, for DSOs, I'm still not good at it. You know, I just uh, I have to back up and, and go back to uh, to either just the camera or, or a, a shorter focal. It's not always the gear. A lot, a, a big part of it is the idiot running the gear, and like you said, yeah. processing. You know, 90% is using the telescope and the other 90% is the processing. They're both big, badly, big, important things. Which one is the harder part for you early versus now? I think the processing. I think uh, I've, I've moved up a couple different times. I, I'm now using Pix Insight, which I I uh, highly recommend. Uh, uh, that That's one thing. That, the other thing I kind of laugh about, these people have $20,000 of gear and you say, maybe you better spend $300 on Pix Insight, and they don't want to spend the money. And I'm kind of thinking, you've gone down the field, you're on the one yard line, now punch it in by getting that, uh, get the right software and, and be able to process. But, uh, you know, you go all the way down the field and then stop at the one yard line. Uh, you know, yeah, it's an expensive piece of software, and that's one of the more expensive things I've got. But, uh, you know, I know people, that, there's others out there, you know, but, uh, you know, Find the one that you like and learn how to use it and take hours. And every time I play with it, I learn something new. Uh, there's times I'll, I'll spend hours processing one picture and I, and I'll look at the end result and not like it. And then I'll just start all over and, and do a few things different. And, and there's a lot. It, it's art. I mean, honestly, because yeah. you could get all of your data and I could process it. And I will guarantee come up with a different picture than the one you come up with because there's so much artistic interpretation. It's not just like taking my smartphone and taking a picture and it is what it is. And if you were standing next to me and took the same picture at the same time, it's going to look the same, right? It's not that there's every, you can invert colors. You can use different palettes. You can make stars disappear in nebula. It's, it's, it's art. It truly is art and not a, static representation of a that of an objective right. scene does that make sense yeah. one of the things that i see a lot of and i try not to do is i see people especially with some of the nebula with uh with uh, you know everybody's favorite first target the orion nebula and they just oversaturate and it's just uh i personally know some people like it 
And that's just it too. Some people like it. I don't like seeing a picture that looks like I stuck my finger at the pin and bled all over it. I don't like that bright, grab you by the throat red. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just my personal preference. Some people like very saturated pictures. Uh, it's just like uh, some people like when they uh, do the nebula, they, re they, they eliminate all the stars. Again, personal preference. You like to eliminate the stars to make that uh, the uh, nebula jump out. That's great. I have gotten to the point now I like to reduce my stars. I like to do some star reduction. But uh, the, the comparison I do on that one for the people that, uh, that uh, eliminate the stars, it's kind of like taking a picture of a mountain and then eliminating all the trees. It's just, yeah. it's, they're there, you know, but uh, again, that's personal preference. Uh, um, I'm sure there's people look at my pictures and say, God, I don't like that at all. And that's, so, that's fine. You know? <laughs> so, show, show some of your pictures. I know you've got a couple of pictures okay, to show. I, I, I've got just a few here. Let me see here. Uh, see if I can so manage to do this right here again. Let's see. Yeah. And so while here. you're doing that, you know, Beatrice Hines from Belgium says, hello, everybody. Uh, and uh, Jim... Uh, uh, Bertol, Bertolf says uh, uh, John appears to be an equipment junkie, uh, and I, I don't know if you're you're more of a dome junkie than an equipment junkie. I think, right? Uh, um, I'm more. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm all about the final result. You know, um, the amount of money I've spent in gear is is small. Um, Couple of my domes I bought really cheap. My roll offs, yeah, I spent some money on roll offs. But uh, one of the things I want to uh, make sure I tell people is I cheat. I'm in a border one location. <laughs> and, um, for somebody that's never seen a border one location, come on down. You see that picture that I've got there of the Milky Way? That was one I did just a few nights ago using the, uh, just a DSLR on just a cheap kit lens. And uh, it's not quite that bright down here, but there's nights when the Milky Way is out, you can go walking around outside and not need a flashlight. Yeah. Now, when the so, moon comes uh, out, the moon is so bright. <laughs> yeah. So Paul Burgart says, I like stars in my DSO, uh, deep sky images, uh, deep sky objects, images, because in my mind, they add realistic context. And I, I agree with that. I like stars. These pictures that people post and, and people, again, they fawn over them because, oh, look, there's no stars. And I guess it does maybe allow you to see more details of the nebula, but it's just not, right. it just doesn't look real. It, it's not what's right? there. It's not what's there. Uh, a lot of times I'm doing with the processing now, I eliminate the stars during processing so I can work on the nebula, concentrate on the nebula, then add the stars back in and reduce the stars. And that's all the no, 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 no. tips. It's alchemy. Inside. Yep. Now, here's a couple it's of pictures. Alchemy. I'm going to show a couple of the pictures. This is, the, this is the snake nebula, which is a dark nebula. And this picture, I, I don't remember exactly which camera or which uh, scope I was using, but just kind of show Oh, it's not sharing. Oh, let's see. What? What, Paul, what did you say? Entire screen. Yeah, you're not sharing your screen right, John, or Paul says, the director. Yeah, I told him. Okay. So, so while you're doing that, um, had a couple more. You say, oh, you're a lucky man to live in Bortle 1. Uh, you made your luck. You picked that spot and you moved there. Right, yeah. It was, it was not luck. It was purely, okay, are you seeing it now? Are you seeing my uh, my picture? Hang, yes. Hang on just a second. Okay. He, we got to do something on our end to make it show. There we go. Okay. okay. So that, that's, where is that's, this nebula that's... located? Oh, gosh, you would have to ask me that. Um, <laughs> that's okay. It's go not, on. It's not, so. too far. it's not too far. It's it's up kind of near near the near the Milky Way, if I remember right. But uh, okay. the reason I, I, I brought this one up is to show you that I think was using a refractor I borrowed from a friend, I think focal length of 420. And then here it is using my reflector. Are you seeing it with a little more zoomed in and, and oriented the other direction? But look at those stars. Now, if I was to reprocess yeah. one, this one now, I'd probably reduce those stars. But this is what I did probably so, two years ago. So somebody asked, and I didn't know who it was, 
<coughs> ask if you like uh, spikes in your stars, which, you know, re reflectors like this one uh, produce, and like this one of the Horsehead Nebula, the secondary mm -hmm. or the, the veins that hold the secondary in place produce those spikes. And um, people, there are programs that add the spikes for pictures that are taken with refractors, which do not produce those spikes. People mm -hmm. will put those in. Which do you like more? Do you like the spikes or does it matter? I, I like the spikes, but it could be because I'm a reflector guy. I've always used reflectors, and, and I'm, that's what I'm used to. I kind of laugh about it because there's people that are using some people that are using refractors, and they want to put in the spikes. And I just mm -hmm. laugh and say, well, just go buy a reflector then if you want spikes. You know, so and, and there it's are, kind of that Ford Chevy thing, you know. <laughs> and there are, there are picture, people with reflectors who want to take them out. And it's, just, yeah. the, it's the weirdest yeah. thing for sure. All right, yeah. So there's a picture of, what is that? I believe uh, that's a lagoon there the, recently. Lagoon. Okay. I was going to say, one I knew it was the rosette. I, re, I reduced the stars quite a bit on this one. I didn't eliminate them, but I reduced them to make that nebula really, really come out. I've also done different versions of this where it is the very vibrant red. And on some where you can bring a little more of the blue out, but I just again it's not uh, not something I like as much. This is the the one I did relatively recently of the eagle, and you can see uh, there's the part of the the uh, pillars of creation, which of mm -hmm. course is the the real famous uh, uh, picture that they used uh, that the Hubble, you know, they they shared a number of years ago. I think I was I think it was back in '95 when they first. Uh, uh, shared that picture kind of with the world. And, and now but, uh, and now there are people who are didn't doing nearly as good photos as the Hubble got mm -hmm. because of the post processing advances and better cameras and better optics. Right. Yeah. It's just it's kind of amazing what uh I'm gonna do the quit sharing here, try to uh, is that are we back to back to normal? <laughs> Paula, we, okay. He thinks, but yeah, I I tell people that uh, you know if you've never been to a board of one location, uh, come down here. Uh, the other thing is interesting. We we talked a little bit about our, our rental house, and about a third probably of the people that come rent are astronomers. But I can usually tell when it's an astronomer that's coming down to rent because they they schedule during the new moon. Right now, I have a right. gentleman that's here for a month. He was here for a month uh, last year. Let's see. Top of screen sharing. There, we, there we go. Okay. We'll learn this thing eventually. But uh, he's a gentleman that uh, he came down from Spokane, Washington for a month just for our dark skies. And he's strictly a uh, visual uh, guy, he doesn't he doesn't do astrophotography at all. And the other evening, I was over. Uh, well, I, I've got kind of a walking path that connects all the observatories, so I can walk back and forth from our house over to the other house, where and uh, it connects the observatories. But I was over there the other evening, and he's you know, well, there's times I'll go over and talk, and we'll end up visiting for two hours about astronomy, about telescopes, about observatories, about all these different things. And this is the guy that he uh, he had taught astronomy at both the high school and college level, and uh, he I was over there with him the one evening, and he, he was static. He was looking at some some star clusters that were pretty hard, -hand. and he was just ecstatic that he was finding them. The views he was seeing were just he was just it was it was like the last time I'd seen people that excited is the first time they looked through a telescope and maybe saw the rings of Saturn. But here's a guy that's been yeah. into astronomy for decades. And a couple of days later, I was over there visiting him again. And I, and I uh, had a fellow that stopped here to visit and wanted to see the observatory. So we were over at the house visiting with Larry. And Larry said, uh, and I said, you know, the other evening I was over here with Larry. And I said, I've never seen a 70-year-old man as excited. And Larry looks at me and he says, I hate to break it to you, John, but I'm 80. Uh -huh. He was an 80 year old that's been doing astronomy for decades 
and to see the excitement when he was looking at things through his telescope. And then he had me stop over the other night and, I, and had me just sit down with his big binoculars. And I was scanning through the Milky Way with his big binoculars and was able to identify things. I don't do a lot of visual anymore. I, you know, I mainly, say you're, uh, yeah. my, my scopes have probably a camera attached to them 95% of the time. Now, I do some visual right. once in a while, but I'll, I'll be taking pictures and do a little visual at the same time. But, uh, but, but you're, there are people that I, I will deal with who literally have never, don't, have, don't own an eyepiece. You know, the telescope right. and camera is 100% of the time hooked up. And many times, there are people who live under Bortle 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 skies. For those of you out there who don't know and are seeing this, Bortle is a scale. It was created by a guy whose last name is Bortle as a way to quantify br sky brightness. And sky brightness, a Bortle sky of one is unpolluted or very, very minor polluted skies. There's not a single place in the United States that is not affected by light pollution. So there are no true, I guess what would be Bortle Zero, absolutely right. unpolluted dark skies. Uh, so everything has some pollution, Bortle One. Whereas Bortle Nine would be like in downtown Las Vegas or New York or somewhere like that. And so uh, most of the people, I'm going to guess, looking at light pollution maps, most of the people in the United States and in Europe live under Bortle six or seven or eight or nine skies, meaning they can't really ever see the Milky Way. And so they are reduced to the miracle of doing astrophotography with narrowband filters because it allows them to take pictures of things they cannot see. That is alchemy as well, it seems to me. Uh, but, you know, if you've never been to a dark sky site, like uh, I'm going to the Nebraska Star Party in July, uh, again, Portal 1 skies, uh, you can see you can see your diffuse shadow from the Milky Way. Uh, it's the freakiest thing on Earth to look down and see your shadow on the ground in the middle of a moonless night and to be able to walk around and see the ground and see dips and rises and walk safely. The miracle of the human eye right there. It's a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. For a lot of those people that live in the, in the more light polluted areas, they can still get away with doing astro planetary. You know, I guess that's yes, the one thing that absolutely. Really, you know, uh, you can see the planets uh, even under uh, light polluted skies. And uh, for those that want to get into that, they can get away with it. You know, uh, otherwise yeah. people ask me about filters. Well, you know what? I don't have any filters. I don't need any filters. I'm in some right. of the darkest skies in the country. From our place, I can see lights. Uh, there, in fact, there's there's a, a string of lights that I can see. Uh, there's a a, a a way station up on Interstate 10, and there's a whole series of lights at that way station up on Interstate 10, and I can see those lights. But then uh, I have to remember they're 25 miles away, so. Yeah. There's not much between me and those lights are 25 miles away. We're up a little bit above uh, the San Simone River Valley, and there's a lot of little places down in the valley. So I see lights, but most of them are below my horizon. And it's kind of like, hey, oh, a light here and a light there doesn't, doesn't affect me much. I'm going to see if I can't uh, show a couple more different pictures. Uh, try, try this again, see if I can get this to work right. Practice makes perfect. Yeah, eventually we'll uh, I'll have this figured out. Let's see. Oh, there we go. So, I think do I you did process have at night? What's that? Do you process at night? Do you process it during the daytime and just shoot at night, or do you start processing this as things come in? I usually wait till process the next day. Sometimes I'll take shots and it'll be days before i uh before i get to them let's see here hopefully i think sometimes it takes a little time there's a little time delay but this is one of my pictures of of the orion nebula if it's coming up so you're on the screen right now it looks like john I'm trying to get uh 
Get this Orion Nebula up. The Orion Nebula is probably the most photographed thing in the sky other than the moon. And right. inadvertently the sun. You know, it's it, if people want to start astrophotography, almost always they go to Orion Nebula first, which is a very difficult target because its surface brightness has such variability. Very fine, wispy details, but you're, you had a very bright center. Uh, Carl Berthart says, I love the dark skies of western New Mexico. So, for those of you who want to experience the dark sky, uh, Explore Scientific is going to have the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party September 21 through 25 at Oracle State Park. Really nice skies. It's close hour north of Tucson, but blocked. Uh, Tucson is blocked by Mount Lemmon. And uh, the SQM meter readings there uh, that Scott has taken himself with a sky quality meter have been 21.8 and 9, which are really dark, clear skies. So that's coming up. If you're interested in it, uh, go to our website or shoot me an email. Shoot us an email at explore alliance at explorescientific.com and we can tell you more details but it's on the website if you just search for david h levy arizona dark sky star party 149 dollars plus you know all your expenses and that does that gets you the event it doesn't get you any hotel or anything else but uh a uh, great you know series of talks are planned uh tour of the biosphere too and uh, going to be a good time. And I uh, meet some of your fellow uh, people interested in astronomy and astrophotography. So, John, have you got that to share yet? It's not popped not up. Is it, are you seeing it yet? I I thought I did what I needed to. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Hold your tongue just right. Yeah. You know, my dad used to do that. My dad used to oh, put his there tongue we go. out. And then, there it is. There it is. Okay. That's one of mine. And, and see, this is one of those targets that I, I see a lot of times gets very overprocessed. This, I think I must have combined a lot of different short and long exposures. Because if you look where my cursor is pointing, you can see the trapezium. Mm -hmm. And a lot of now times that gets blown out when you, when you take long exposures. The trapezium is a star forming region. Uh, it's a shaped like a trapezoid, and you can see, you know, individual stars there in there. Man. There you go. You can see four stars that make the trapezoid. So, this is a prop. This is, you know, effectively, you have to take four or five different exposures and short exposure for the trapezium part, a little bit longer uh, for the, the white part. And then to capture all those perimeter details, you know, takes blending things together. Uh, oh. So th you took this one, correct? Yeah, that's one that I had done. I don't remember. It, it was a while back. But, so uh, that, that is that oversaturation you're talking about right there. Right. The, yeah, right. Uh, uh, yeah, uh -oh. I try not to get it bright, bright red. Let's see. I'm trying to look at the... Uh, Got to be smarter than the screen. I keep saying it. Let's see. Are you see? Are you seeing a bunch of different pictures here now? No, it wasn't. Went away. We're just seeing you. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that, that's not the best thing to see, is it? So you've got a pretty robust. I mean, you live live pretty remotely, but you've got a fairly good uh, internet connection. Do you have a satellite internet? Are you wired or what? I'm wired right now. Um, I know not a lot of folks around here are going to the uh, to the uh, Starlink. I haven't yet. Uh, I've got some people that are really pushing me that I should do that, and then be able to serve both of these houses with one one account. Basically, I haven't done that yet. Right. Uh, are you are so you seeing Tariq the witch's said, head now? Nope. So All Tariq right. is saying that uh, you know he can see the Orion constellation from where he lives. Uh, and many targets are now getting higher in the sky, so getting away from the light pollution. Uh, I hope I can broad do broadband good enough. Well, you've got to uh, keep trying, Tariq. And I, one thing I see people do is 
they change um, uh, too many variables at once. They don't follow good scientific principles. They'll change four things and they can't figure out what changed. Okay, John, we are now seeing the witch's head nebula. And, you know, obviously looking at the picture, the chin is on the bottom right, the mouth and the nose and the eye and then the long forehead and hair. Yeah. This is one of those things that if you turn it 90 degrees, you just don't see it. You know, it's one of those things where yeah. if you have it upside down, uh, some Actually, of these nebula, yeah. you know, <laughs> whoops, now I went to the next picture. It's not what I meant to do, but. Uh... So one of those looks in one, one, at one of the, of the witch's head nebula, John, looks like mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln to me. <laughs> not sure why I can't go, go back, back to that one now. Oh, uh, darn. Yeah, it's, 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 it. it's, it's, uh, I'm just going to, are you still seeing a, like the, like right now I've got the bubble nebula on there. Are yes. you seeing that yes. one? Yes. Yes, sir. Just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, as we're talking, just kind of go randomly go through some of these There's, pictures that, uh, you know, this is, it must be the California nebula. California. Some of these, you know, you know, and, uh, and again, it, the witch's head and this one were done with, with, you know, uh, shorter focal lengths, of course. You can't right. get it all with, with my normal with my normal 1,000. Yeah, and you can see there's no spikes, so you know that that was either a right. lens or a refractor. Uh, I, yeah, some of these I don't remember. You, yeah, you can always tell oh. which ones. I think this is the northern triffid, if I remember right. Yeah, it's not uh, the triffid. It doesn't have those lines to it. Yeah, a lot of these are ones that I've done some time back, and it's like, yeah, I need to redo, you know, but uh, there's part of the veil. But uh, elephant's trunk, I recognize. Trunk. One of many, many so, galaxies. That too many of them look too much alike. There's the, so, the uh, fish head. So, John, do you use plate solving to yes. uh, point? Okay, it's the flame yeah. nebula. So yeah. plate solving is where you let the camera take, uh, with a program, you take a picture of the sky it analyzes it, determines where the camera is pointing, and then from that you can point it to to anything in the sky. Is that the uh, the uh, ghost ghost of Jupiter? Go, ghost That's of Jupiter. Jupiter. There we go. I Which couldn't is pull a it pretty out. Pretty small, relatively bright uh, planetary nebula, and this was done with uh, with one of the Schmitz. This was done with the uh, eight inch Schmitz, so I think a two thousand millimeter focal length and cropped to get in there that tight. So uh, right. I need to do a little more playing around with some of these smaller things, uh, you know, with the you know, focal extenders. Uh, yeah. That's the heart nebula, Here's, the heart nebula, the heart part the of the heart, heart and soul. Again. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. a lot of people uh, um, have trouble, you know, focal extenders on Schmitz or uh, refractors uh, are your friend when you're doing planetary and planet, planetary nebula photos, you know, getting up there, you know, 5,000, 6,000 millimeters. Is that the jellyfish nebula? Yeah, that one was, that was the jellyfish. And right. then of course right. the uh, Leo triplet. And and again, some of these, it's like, yeah, some of these are, are I, I've gone to, I finally got some of my stuff organized and went through and found my single best of a lot of different objects. And sometimes my single best was two or three years ago. And, you know, so but it John, was the single best I've got. Stay, stay out, go back to that picture you were just on of Leo Triplet. Question for you. There you go. From a processing standpoint. You know, in the old days, we would burn and dodge things to make faint things mm -hmm. show up more. Um, you know, this almost looks like a burn and dodge. Is that the case where so, you selectively said highlight that or what kent can you hear me yes so i just want to interject a little bit what you're seeing on the screen is being manipulated by the screen share so some of the colors may be saturated by the program and not exactly the way he developed them ah that makes yeah. sense okay yeah, yeah. But a lot of these, yeah, there's a lot you can do in processing, you know, with, with your saturation and your curves and uh, to try to bring things. 
one of the other things I see a lot of times happen is the sky gets just black, you know, or they, and the term they use is they clip it. They get the, the, the background just black. And, and it really isn't black, uh, you know, but again, it's, it's some of its personal preference. You know, uh, this one here, I don't remember exactly which target this is. I had different versions of this and some are vibrant red and some are red with a little bit of blue coming out. You know, and now I now I've been playing a little bit. Oh, there's there's one. Of, I think that's what my best uh, uh, M1. The um, okay. Why am I drawing a blank on M1? Crab Nebula. Crab Nebula. Yeah, and uh, you can see that uh, this is one that the sky is real black. I'm getting a little more color than maybe I wanted out of some of these the, the stars. You know, that's one of the things you risk. You try to bring more color out of your nebula. Then you know if you're doing the stars at the same time, maybe they get a little overdone. And it's a, so, uh, I've yeah. removed the coloring the best I can, and made it the flattest image I can get it to be. So this is close to your original work that uh, okay. I can get it. It's yeah. compression over the internet. It's it does it. It messes with the colors from time to time. Yeah. Well, even just whichever screen you're M looking on. Yeah. Is this yeah. M13? Is this M13? Uh, it, or either Omega? that or it might be Omega Centauri. I can shoot Omega Centauri from down here. Yeah. It never gets more than about 12 degrees above the horizon, but I have shot it. This might be. I think. I have done a I side by side of those two ones. I think yeah. that's Omega and not. Because in M13, there's a little galaxy. Wait a second, wait a second. Oh, that's M3. I can see up here in the M3. corner, it says okay. M3. Okay. Okay. I'll bet if I go a little farther, because uh, I renamed all the files, there's, okay. Yeah, if I was smart, I'd look up here in the corner. That's M8 and M20, Triffid. Uh, so, yeah, if I'm smart, I look up here. I've got the file names up in the corner. There's okay. another M8 I that I'd done some time back. You can see, I, you know, I, well, at that time, brought more color into it. Yep. Here is M9 which is one of the clusters, but it's kind of neat. There's some dark nebula over in here. I'm just going to... And dark yeah, nebula are just clouds. Yeah. This was done with a just a, a, a camera where I've got M16 and M17 in the same shot. And they're kind of within the Milky Way. So look, look at all those stars. You know, it's a, and that's an older one of a did of M16, M17. I have it's a question. It's a while to get through. Yeah. Um, when you're shooting with just the camera, what lens, and is it APS-C full frame, full frame, or what? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I'm using an, a, 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 a Canon T6, and I'm just using for the lenses. I've just got an 18 to 55 kit lens and a 75 to 300, just really cheap lenses. I, you know, a lot of people go out and buy just a, uh, uh, the zoom lenses are not as good as a fixed focal length lens. Right. I just, I'm cheap. My, my friends call me cheap or they call me caveman <laughs> because when they're using auto focusers and they're running everything remote and they're doing all these things and I'm going outside into my observatory, I got to walk a whole 50 feet out to the observatory yeah. and put a batten off mask on and focus manually, you know. And then so, I can come back so, in the house now and, and run it remote once I'm set up. The T6 is John, an APS-C, which is uh, a crop sensor. It's not quite right. the pixel enlargeness of a full frame. And so, the 300 millimeter lens, if you use something like uh, Lightroom from Adobe, then mm -hmm. you can actually... Uh, input that lens into the lens correction deal that it has and it has they've gone through and and used all these lenses and taken all the more a and the and the distortion out of it uh in post and it's already done for you right so yeah there's going so to be john, more more of those routines yeah so john you had you, you said you know it's better to have a fixed fo focal length lens than a zoom lens I want to tell people, don't let that stop you from starting, right? You can find plenty of reasons yeah. to stop. Use what you've got. We, yeah. And start now. Just start doing it. Those are some pretty shots. 
M38 was one of those pictures in there, I'm certain. Uh, one of my favorite things that I used to be able to see from my driveway that I can't see anymore. You know, 20 uh-huh. years later, it's disappeared into the brightness. Uh, and M36, 37, and 38 in a constellation named Auriga. It looks like a pentagon or a hat box up in the sky. Um, close, Fairly close to Orion is one of my favorite areas just because they were so easy and, 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 and you know, off the beaten track and really close together, easy to find in a, in a small telescope. Uh, so that is, what is that, John? Um, M78. I, I look okay. over there's an M78, which is the Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula. And yes. This is one of those things. It's like, okay, where is Casper? I, I don't see Okay, it. I see. Okay. The Casper is the bright area uh, just below that black, dark nebula. And in a telescope, looks like it's got two bright eyes. And John, move your move your cursor a little bit right here, right up a little. Oops. Go up, keep up just a little bit. Right there, there's two dots. Right there, there's two little eyes down just a wee bit. <laughs> okay. There's two. Anyway, right there's one eye, and then move to your left, and there's the other eye right there. No, too far. Right there's a little white area. Right, there. right there's his face. Right there. So think. Yeah, right in there. Those two are his eyes. Okay. And when you see it in a, in a telescope, it looks like a kid with a sheet on, uh, like okay. a Halloween ghost. Yeah. It's and it does. Things, it now, really that, looks... now that I've seen it, now that you pointed it out, now I see it. Now I probably can't unsee it. You can't unsee okay. it. But that's. But it literally looks like a little cast with a ghost visually up in the sky. Okay, uh, it's five o'clock. We've got to knock off. Uh, Paul has another broadcast. We got to get going to. So, John, sum up the ways to start your journey and make improvement quickly. You did this all without a mentor, correct? Somebody, you didn't, did you part, have yes, somebody I, sitting there I, helping I, you? I keep learning. What's that? I, there we go. So, you sat there, John, and did you have a mentor back when you started, or did you just, force your way through I this. just I just started and learned by my my my, my mistakes and that's why uh, when we talked about I'm in a lot of these different groups and I try to help people because I love watching other people make progress you know when somebody is learning and uh, I have almost as much fun watching other people make progress as make watching myself make progress yeah. and I've yet to meet an astronomer that says stay away from my gear and I'm not going to help you at all because everybody's so helpful. There's times that I, I have a lot to learn with uh, with doing planetary. I know some guys that are really good at planetary. They're helping me. And so we uh, we swap back and forth. Uh, there's people all over the world that that I talk with and and I help and they help me. And, and it's that that's a big part of the fun of it. OK, but we yeah, got, the, we got one is, minute. If you've got gear, go out and use it. If you think you're not get good and good enough results, it might not be the gear. You know, everybody always wants to blame the gear, but most of the time it's the idiot running the gear. I picked an, exp- an expression from a guy I met from England one time. He said, it's all, all gear and no idea. And I see that yep. too often. And, and when you say the idiot running the gear, you include yourself in that idiot statement. You know, absolutely. Uh, I've made I've made every yeah. mistake you can make out there. You know, it's uh, the wrong star. I've polar lined on the wrong star. You yep. know, if you're not, yep. polar, we've all done it. Polar line. <laughs> yeah. All right, John, thank you for sharing a little bit of your time and your insights with us. I'm going to start ha- trying to get some more people on to give these inspirational stories about how did you start? What was your journey? You know, uh, what mistakes did you make? Things like that. So yeah. anyway, um, so, for John, people, I'll give for you... people out there, uh, I just want to put a little plug in here. Go find me on Facebook and, yes. and find Valley Vista Getaway. The name of our little place that... is called Valley Vista Getaway. And we have a Facebook page and an internet page. But look me up and look those up. Um, if you want to friend me, that'd be great for anybody that's out there yeah, but, that aren't already but... friends. So, once again, Valley Vista Getaway. Is that your getaway. URL? Yeah. Uh, dot com yes yep okay yep it's a dot valley com. and we also have a facebook valley, page valley it's vista valley getaway vista dot com getaway. yeah okay uh everybody says this is fun john uh they're thanking you paul burkhart beatrice hines 
uh, lots of our regular folks. Uh, Gary Koneman says, great show, you guys. Thank you, Gary. We appreciate that very much. You know, we see everybody that joins us on these shows become our family, and they get uh, conversations going amongst themselves. Uh, Tariq says, thank you, John, for showing your work and your presentation. Yeah, Tariq. Uh, I've read a few names I've recognized uh, that, are, that popped up down here. Yeah. Yeah. So can you see those two? Uh, you can see those names yeah. popping up, John. I know you could. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, once again, we got to go. Paul's got to get set up for another show. Uh, John, uh, keep up the great work. And, you know, you are a great resource uh, when you answer people's questions. And when I see your name up, I pop up and read it. And it's mm -hmm. virtually every time it's like, yep. That's right. You know, you, you give <laughs> good advice and, you know, uh, there's been times when, when I've said something and you chimed in going, absolutely. And I've done the same thing. And it's not because we know each, each other. We agree on those things, you know, on ways to get started or problems. And a lot of times we overcomplicate things. I do it, make things simple, start simple and try and keep it simple. Anyway, uh, John, Thank you, sir, for being on. Well, I will. Welcome, uh, yes. I, I will see you on uh, Facebook, and maybe you can make it to Arizona. We're going to be fairly close, so maybe you can make right. it to the Arizona Dark Sky uh, Start Part Star Party in September. Uh, maybe even just came by for a day. It'd be cool to hang out with you. So right. anyway, yep. if there's I, any other topic, any other thing, you know, you know me. I've got other things I can talk about. So anytime you need something, Ken, yeah. just give me a shout. Thanks, John. All right. We're out so of here. Kent, uh, what we're doing yes. next, uh, really quick, um, we have got a, if I can get this to go back, we've got the Investigating Asteroids with Lucy's Scientific Instruments, a nice video from NASA, I believe. Yes, NASA, so we're gonna Goddard call that, so, Media Studios. So. If we ran out, of, if we ran out of things to talk about, I was going to talk about asteroids real quick. So I'll just talk about them. Uh, yes, asteroids can make a big impact when they collide with Earth, uh, but also they're sometimes just meteors. Uh, they form in the asteroid belt. Uh, there are millions of them, um, and it was believed at time we might not be able to fly through the asteroid belt without collisions. Uh, There's a radiation belt too. Their theories. Uh, which is uh, responsible for one-third of the belt's entire mass, is a dwarf planet. It was elevated from just an asteroid to a dwarf planet. Uh, and asteroids can have moon. they can, moons. They can have enough uh, mass. mass to create... Uh, Where's Bruce uh, Willis? Yes, for when, we need, when we need a mission to blow up an asteroid coming at Earth. Yeah. All right, let's get out of here, Paul. So Run I'm the gonna video. Play the, we're going to... Nice little... Just, yeah. yeah go ahead john yeah. you can drop off we'll see you john bye all right thanks guys so yeah we're gonna look at the investigating asteroids with lucy's scientific instruments from goddard media studies at nasa the lucy spacecraft will be taking a journey where no other spacecraft has gone before the trojan asteroids the Trojans are two groups of asteroids that lead and trail Jupiter in its orbit around the Sun, and they've been trapped in these stable locations for over four billion years. Lucy will have a suite of scientific instruments for collecting data as it flies by the asteroids. The LORI is a long-range reconnaissance imager. It's often referred to as Lucy's eagle eyes since it has the highest spatial resolution of all of Lucy's cameras. This Can't, black and white camera me? is actually a type of telescope. Yes. The same not, kind as the Hubble Space Telescope. The main feed the Lori was built to produce clear images of okay. the Trojan's craters, they can't hear which us. will be a challenge since the Trojan okay. asteroids are extremely so, dark. I can take off. The Lori will be able to see 75-yard yeah, wide off, craters from over 600 miles away. That's like standing at one end of a football field and being able to see a fly at the other end. The instrument's simple design does not use optical Actually, filters and includes no moving parts reducing the risk of part failure during the mission. The LORI will also search the Trojans for evidence of any rings and new satellites. The instrument's ability to see faint targets from far away also makes it perfect for optical navigation. 
Lalori will help Lucy navigate to a point in space, and then a terminal tracking camera aboard the spacecraft, known as T2CAM, will help the instruments accurately point towards the targets. LATES is Lucy's thermal emission spectrometer, which detects far infrared radiation emitted by the asteroids due to how they are heated up by sunlight. LATES detects this radiation using a small telescope to focus the incoming energy onto a detector, similar to the way a remote thermometer works. So, the test is not taking images, but rather, temperature measurements at various points on the asteroid. This data will be combined so that scientists can get an understanding of its surface properties. The test will examine the properties of the regolith on the surface by measuring thermal inertia, which is the measure of how slowly the asteroid heats up from sunlight, and then releases that heat. By taking the temperature readings at different parts of the asteroid, the Lucy science team can measure the thermal inertia and figure out how much dust, sand, or rock is present on the asteroid's surface. That data will tell us a lot about how the asteroid was formed, providing insight into the history of our solar system. Lucy's Le Ralph instrument will search the Trojans for organics, ices, and hydrated minerals, and will help determine the surface compositions of the asteroids. Le Ralph is actually two instruments in one, and together they will measure and analyze the spectra of light absorbed and reflected by the asteroid. The first is a color visible imager, the Multispectral Visible Imaging Camera, or MVIC. It takes visible light color images of the Trojan asteroids. The second is an infrared imaging spectrometer, known as LISA, the Linear Edelon Imaging Spectral Array, which collects infrared spectra of the asteroids. Like LaLaurie, LaRalph does not have a focusing mechanism. Instead, it is designed to stay in focus despite the extreme temperature differences in space by being made almost entirely from a single block of aluminum. Using one material throughout the instrument means that if a part expands or contracts, the other parts will expand or contract at the same rate, helping to keep Le Ralph in focus. Even the mirrors are made of aluminum, finely polished with diamond dust. Due to the massive size of the images Le Ralph will be taking, the instrument will have around 256 gigabits of onboard memory. And while the Le Ralph instrument aboard Lucy does require substantially more power than its predecessors on other spacecraft, it will still not use more energy than your average ceiling fan. In addition to these three main science instruments, other experiments aboard the spacecraft will help fulfill the mission. Lucy will use its high-gain antenna to communicate with Earth for an additional radio science experiment to determine the masses of the asteroid targets. Lucy will also be able to use its two terminal tracking cameras, or T2CAM, to track the asteroids during the flybys, keep them in the field of view, and to take wide-field images so that we can better determine their shapes and perhaps discover new asteroids nearby. As you can see, the Lucy spacecraft has a large suite of tools to study the Trojan asteroids, which will help us better understand the formation of our solar system. Hey everybody, appreciate you staying with us. Tomorrow we're going to have, let's see, uh, on the wing, and then I believe the 4 o'clock broadcast is going to be uh, an Explorer Alliance broadcast. We're changing things up a little bit. So see you at 1.30 for on the wing and 4 o'clock for an Explorer Alliance broadcast. Have a great day. See you all. Bye-bye. Yeah. Back left on the little light that's under, on the back of it. Well, I should have left the other lights on. What'd you think?